when it comes to Donald Trump's mindset about Iran recently he had an interview in which he was talking about Iran he said that he has no problem with Iran just the nuclear program he wants to negotiate with Iran if he goes in that direction as he mentioned in that interview let us assume that do you think Iran would be willing to talk with him or the Iran's priority right now it's what's going on in Gaza in Lebanon and on they can talk about nuclear program but the priority is what's going on there well a number of things have changed again one is that as i explained earlier iran is much more powerful today iran and its allies the axis of resistance they're much more powerful today than they were eight years ago look at yemen uh, in particular how things have changed Look how Hezbollah has been able to prevent Israelis from advancing into Lebanon, which is quite astounding. The Israelis have been unable to effectively enter Lebanon. And still they failed to take the dot called Gaza. But uh, that aside, uh, there are a number of things that have changed. One is that uh, the Israeli regime as long as it's making threats against Iran and Iran's nuclear program or any other nuclear threats, then what would be the incentive for Iran to sign a nuclear deal? Because we've seen Dr. Kharazdi, who's the leader's foreign policy advisor, say very explicitly that if there's some sort of existential threat against Iran, or an attack on Iran's nuclear program, Iran's nuclear posture will change, and that Iran can very swiftly develop a nuclear weapon. Iran is one of the 10 most advanced countries in the world when it comes to nuclear energy. And of course, Iran's military capabilities are now well known and well respected. And in the past, the West liked to ridicule it, but now I think they think very differently. So, I think that would be a major calculation. As long as there's a, a, a threat from the Zionist regime, then I think Iran will view its nuclear program very differently. In fact, perhaps in the eyes of many, it's very fortunate that Iran, that Trump actually left the nuclear deal and that uh, Biden failed to uh, abide by the deal or negotiate a deal with Iran because today, the the threats of the, being made by this maniac in Tel Aviv uh, are taken seriously in Iran. So that's that's one issue. The second is that the world has changed. Eight years ago, when Trump was in power, the focus of the United States was Iran. Iran was the real enemy. It was the evil. It was the axis of evil. And Russia, of course, was an issue. Trump opponents used Russiagate against him, which was fake. It was never a real thing. There was never any evidence for Russiagate. But uh, Hillary Clinton and her people couldn't accept the fact that some game show host was able to humiliate her this way. So it had to be someone else. But uh, so, and China was becoming an economic competitor, which uh, was was a concern, a growing concern. But Iran was the bad guy. And but now that has changed. The United States during the last few years during, has antagonized so many different countries, and in particular China and Russia. That now, whenever they name Iran, they name it alongside these two countries. So in the past, it was Iran. Now it's Russia, China, and Iran. So that makes it a lot more complicated. And of course, Iranian relations, as I said earlier, with these countries have, have evolved significantly during this period. And these countries are concerned about the United States. So Russia, Iran knows that a failure by Russia is not good news for Iran. Failure in Iran would not be good for Russia. And the same is true with China. Any success by the Americans anywhere would lead to the United States becoming, the, the regime in Washington becoming more aggressive 
and more hopeful for further successes. So, so this this these dynamics have changed significantly. Also, and and this, by the way, I think is going to influence U.S. Uh, capability to try to uh, undermine Iran, because the United States not only does it impose economic sanctions, and not only does it support terrorist groups that are based in northern Iraq, in Europe, and in on the border in the no man's land alongside the Pakistani border, but also the United States uh, has a huge anti-Iranian Persian language media apparatus. It's enormous, and uh, tens of thousands of people are employed by it. Iranians, tens of thousands of people, and many thousands of them must are Iranian. The different television channels, websites, uh, telegram channels, all sorts of uh, cyber armies, yeah, tens of thousands of Iranians must be employed across the world. Now the United States, because of Russia, because of China, is no longer going to be able to focus as it did before on Iran. And we are already seeing signs of these media outlets having financial difficulties, some of them uh, more than others. So the, the Americans cannot focus on Iran in the way in which they used to. And as I said, even though many say that Trump is going to patch things up with Russia. I don't see that happening easily. A lot of blood has been spilled, but also, as I said, the issue, is, the issue of Ukraine is either going to be a Russian victory or it's going to be continued warfare. And a Russian victory would mean that Trump will have to concede a huge deal, uh, a lot, and that would be very humiliating for him. They, the, his opponents would make it a humiliation for him. This is, of course, is something that should have ended two and a half years ago. And we all knew from the very beginning that uh, NATO would fail. We all knew that the counteroffensive would fail. And we knew that what's happening now uh, would ultimately happen. But um, uh, the Americans and the Europeans have paid a heavier price, thus weakening themselves even further. But uh, patching things up with Russia, I don't think, is going to happen that easily. So we are where we are. And it's very difficult to predict the future. But I, 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 again, I think that the United States is in a much more difficult situation in this region than it was before. And Trump is going to have to face a new reality. And most importantly, is that people on the streets across the region have reached boiling point. They are outraged, whether in Egypt, whether in Saudi Arabia, whether in Turkey, and I'm not quite sure how that will play out. If Defense Minister of Israel was fired by Netanyahu, and do you think, is that related to what's, what's happening right now in the southern part of Lebanon and the way that Hezbollah is fighting? I think that um, the Minister of Genocide, his removal, is um, not good news for the Israelis. I think it's very bad news. It's good news for Netanyahu. But as I always believed, Netanyahu is Israel's worst enemy. Netanyahu is fighting for his own survival, not, not for the survival of this genocidal apartheid regime. His priority is Netanyahu. And therefore, he will do anything it, that it takes to preserve power, to remain at the top. And uh, ultimately, that is going to damage the interests of, of you know, these, these Zionists, these ethno-supremacist Zionists who, who, who live in Palestine, who control Palestine. And that's exactly what has happened over the, over the last year. In the, what's happened, uh, pro-Netanyahu uh, Israelis or many of his opponents consider the last year or so to have been a success. But I think there's, a, there's sort of an, an echo chamber and they are listening to themselves and they don't see how things have changed. You know this and your viewers know this, but 
but just to remind ourselves, Israel once could go all the way to the Suez Canal swiftly take over Sinai. Now it cannot defeat Hamas and Islamic Jihad and other allies in, in this dot called on the map called Gaza. Once upon a time in 1982 and before, but also in 1982, the Israeli regime was able to go all the way to Beirut within four or five days and then take the capital. Now Hezbollah has pushed them back. They tried to take Al Khiyam, and in a heroic battle, the Hezbollah beat them back. So is the Israeli regime has failed in Gaza, it's failed in Lebanon. Yes, they're massacring people. Just last night they they carried out numerous massacres, a big massacre in, in a in a village in Lebanon and of course in, in Gaza as well. Uh, among other and massacres and western media is silent now they're, they're always silent and it's very interesting in gaza they pretend you know we we don't that they don't have a presence but in beirut i know some of these journalists i know many of them uh, but they they hide the fact that uh, ordinary people are being targeted so the israelis are killing ordinary people but they're not willing winning on the battlefield and so far in its, in its exchange with iran it doesn't have the upper hand in the, in the airstrike on Iran, as I said before, it wasn't a success. If it was a success, we would have seen it. They, they, they did cause damage. People were killed. But it, they were supposed to wipe out the Iranian air defenses and uh, and, uh, and shock us. We, we were supposed to not know what hit us. But that certainly didn't happen. So I would say that uh, it's clear that the Israelis have failed on all these fronts and then there's the Iraqi resistance and then there's the Yemeni resistance that's constantly striking at Israel and causing hurt. And it's only going to get worse. And of course, we have the Iranian strike that it's that is going to come. And uh, I personally, from the very start, didn't I didn't believe that Iran would strike uh, the Israeli regime. I didn't want to say this before because even though I don't have any government position, uh, but I didn't want to decrease concerns among uh, people in Palestine, Israeli uh, Israelis in, in Palestine. Uh, I didn't think Iran would strike before the U.S. election because it, I don't think it would have been appropriate. It, it would have, it could have been interpreted as interfering in U.S. internal affairs and, and ordinary people in the United States or across the West. Uh, there's no need, need to unnecessarily antagonize them. So I think that uh, the Iranians did the smart thing by not striking before uh, the U.S. election, but the Iranians will strike, and they will strike very hard. Of course, President Pezishkian did give a, a, um, a statement, or he, 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 he said basically that if there's a ceasefire that's acceptable to Hamas and Hezbollah collectively because Hezbollah has said that they will not uh, accept a separate ceasefire it has it has to be along with Gaza and it has to be uh, it has to accept Hamas the, the term set by Hamas uh, and uh, so he did say that that would that would impact the severity of or or the 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 uh, the, the the way in which the Iranians would strike Israel. So basically what Dr. Pezeshkan was saying is that we're going to hit the Israeli regime because this is retaliation. They, they began this uh, this aggression and Iran is responding. But uh, he said that if there's a ceasefire for the sake of the people of Gaza and Lebanon, we are willing to uh, lessen the, the, uh, uh, the, the number of missiles and drones and so on that, that are used. But since I don't see that happening, and I don't see uh, a genocidal maniac like Netanyahu moving towards a ceasefire, I think the Iranian strike is inevitable. It is definitely, it is inevitable, but I think it will be quite severe. Hezbollah used a ballistic missile and hit the target, bypassing all the air defense system of Israel, including that. And 
I think right now in the United States, they totally know if they want to go to to escalate the conflict between Iran and Israel, that would be devastating for Israel because Iran, the capabilities of Iran and the way that they're capable to hit the targets in Israel is, is not even comparable to the capability of Hezbollah. Yes, if the two sides choose to slug it out, as they say, then Israel would be defeated. There's there's no doubt about it. If the Israeli regime is very small. It's not a strong regime. The West likes to mythologize and say that this is the, uh, the superpower in the region or the most powerful military in the region. It's not. A, a, a military that's dependent uh, completely on the West that needs a air bridge to constantly bring in new bombs to, so that they can bomb homes in Gaza and in Lebanon, bombs from the from Germany, from from Europe, from the United States, new weapons, new uh, assistance, uh, economic assistance. That is not a powerful regime. That is a very vulnerable regime. But it's also very small. So, if uh, Iran chooses to hit the regime very hard, uh, it would fall apart. And you have to keep in mind, Nima that if things get bad inside Israel, half of the population is Palestinian. If Iran begins, and Iran has, Iran has many more missiles than people imagine. Iran can go wave after wave after wave, and still without touching the missiles that would be used to destroy the Persian Gulf if there's a conflict with the United States, because those are a completely different set of missiles. The missiles that would be used to destroy American bases and to destroy the oil and gas installations across the Persian Gulf are short-range missiles and drones, hundreds of thousands of drones. And we've seen how those drones work. We saw how Aramco was so badly damaged with just a a handful of drones. Where they came from, whether it was Yemen or elsewhere, that's another issue. So all that aside, Iran can fire wave after wave of thousand of a, a thousand missiles for a very long period of time. They can destroy its infrastructure. They can destroy destroy the desalination plants. They can destroy their electrical power plants. And then, if and of course the military, if they do that after a few waves, how are how is the Israeli regime going to control? How is or seven million? Zionists, uh, many have left, but how are 7 million Zionists going to control 7 million Palestinians? 20% of them are inside the 1948 borders. The rest are in within in the West Bank in Gaza. How how the, is how's the Israeli regime going to do that? And then you have the Hezbollah on the northern border as well. I, it's And then you have many Jordanians would like to come in and fight, and maybe some are preparing themselves for that opportunity, and perhaps in Egypt as well. So this is not a battle that the Israeli regime can win. They're completely dependent on the West. But again, Netanyahu, being the the fool that he is and being the selfish uh, person that he is, he is not calculating in a way which benefits Israel. He is calculating in a way in which benefits Netanyahu. But ultimately, I don't think Netanyahu is going to benefit from this. I think that he will be the remembered as the person who actually brought the Israeli regime to destruction. Do you see any sort of change in terms of the U.S. foreign policy in Lebanon? Because they've been trying to isolate Hezbollah in the Biden administration, but how do you see the changes with the new administration in office, with the Trump administration? One of the things that has happened over the year is that the status of Hezbollah this, uh, has grown, not only in, in, in Lebanon, but across the region and the world. Hezbollah today is very popular, and many of the divisions in Lebanon have been washed away among ordinary people. 
Remember, in, in the previous decade, the United States led a dirty war against Syria. Many people were fooled, especially since these Arab despots in the Persian Gulf and Erdogan and the King of Jordan, and of course the Israelis were all a part of this conspiracy against Syria. We know that Jake Sullivan in, on uh, February the 12th, 2012, sent an email to Hillary Clinton saying that Al Qaeda is on our side in Syria. This is like a decade after 9 11. And then soon after that, uh, ISIS emerged from Al Qaeda, and we saw the 2012 Defense Intelligence Agency document where it was stated that US allies in the region wanted to create a Salafist entity between Syria and Iraq to block Syria's. Uh, access to its to friends to, to strike further strangle strangle the country jordan in the south turkey in the north israel to the southwest and then of course shutting the gates to iraq and iran to the east what was that style of his entity it was isis and of course we know what trump said during the campaign in 2016. so it's now becoming clear that the the, the attempt to destroy syria was so that Israel could today destroy the resistance and that this bridge, uh, this victory bridge between Iran and its and Iraq and its allies and Lebanon and Syria and the West Bank and Gaza, that could be broken. But back then, a lot of people were fooled by Western media, by, uh, uh, um, by local media, regional media that was controlled by these despots, very wealthy despots who are using sectarianism and racism and other means to demonize Hezbollah, Iran, and, and other resistance movements. And uh, so there was a, that was reflected in Lebanese society. Lebanese society was divided, deeply divided. In the last election, the Hezbollah coalition, they won, but the divisions were deep. But after what we've seen in Gaza, on October the 7th, and the fact that Hezbollah began sacrifice, making huge sacrificing, sacrifices for them, and Ansar Allah and, and others, the mood changed. Palestinians now love Hezbollah. No one believes the propaganda uh, that these despots were pushing, the West was pushing, Erdogan and Abdullah and others were pushing, and the Israeli regime. Sunnis in Lebanon, they've shifted. Ordinary people, the, the, many of those who are who are politicians, they are they are you know, they they have affiliations that are outside of Lebanon. But ordinary people have tilted dramatically towards Hezbollah. The main antagonist is Samir Jaja, the Lebanese forces, and people like them. And they will always hate Hezbollah. They're the they were uh, people who fought with the Israelis. In 1982, when they invaded Lebanon, back then Hezbollah didn't even exist. But Samir Jaja carried out with the Israelis a, a huge massacre in the Sabra Shatila refugee camp, the Palestinian refugee camp, killing 4,000 men, women, and children in 36 hours. And he is an ally of the U.S. embassy right now. So the the U.S. has a lot, it's going to have a very tough time convincing the overwhelming majority of Lebanese that they and their allies are the good guys and that Hezbollah and their allies are the bad guys. Things have changed a lot. And as I said, it's not just in Lebanon, it's across the region and it's across the world. Today, the axis of resistance is popular. Outside of the Islamic world, it's visible. It's quite visible. Iran has become popular. For, four for over four decades, they demonized Iran. Iran, you know, they, they made Iran look like a, an evil, corrupt, despotic, uh, woman-hating, uh, uh, violent regime. And now people are seeing that they're the genocidal maniacs, the collective West, supporting these ethno-supremacist monsters. And the only people standing in their way are those who are in the axis of resistance. And so the resistance has... Uh, it's people are seeing, they're opening their eyes to this reality that it is Iran. Whatever Iran is, whatever it values 
Iran has, whatever the Islamic Republic of Iran is, it is that which is standing against genocide and standing up to the collective West alone. So the, the things have changed dramatically for Hezbollah, for, for Lebanon, for the region, and therefore for the United States. And uh, I think that when Trump steps into office, he's going to see that he's going to notice very quickly that the world is not the world that he uh, became a part of in 2016 or the world that he left in 2020. Do, do you think right now we have two countries, Iraq and Syria, in which there are a lot of American soldiers? And Trump, in his first ad term, he tried to withdraw the troops, at least he talked about it, withdraw the troops from Syria. Do you think he's going to have the same type of policy? I think it's important to keep in mind that uh, the United States is not the military power that it was before. It has exhausted itself in these endless wars. And ordinary Americans don't want more war. I think even though the Western media has, I mean, the West is not, these are not democracies. Europe is, these are not democracies in Europe and the United States. In the United States, the choice is between a, uh, a Biden or a Harris now and a Trump. That's that's the degree of democracy that they have. And in Europe, whoever they vote for ultimately has to obey Harris or Trump, whoever is elected. It doesn't matter who who's in power in Europe. They have to obey Washington. So these are not democracies. But uh, the when you know the United States is not the power that it was before, and people in the United States are waking up to the fact that the United States is neither a democracy, it is uh, suffering economically, it's endless and endless wars uh, have diminished the country and its capabilities. They're seeing that despite the media, despite the legacy media. And so Trump will have a very difficult time justifying a new war. And I wouldn't take some of U.S. actions too seriously. So, for example, you know that uh, the Americans sent a number of uh, B-52s to Qatar. I would call that the most stupid decision possible. Why? A, it discredits Qatar. And when Iran says, okay, if there is conflict, we are going to destroy all those oil and gas installations, the United States is explaining to the world exactly why the Qatar is used as a U.S. airbase. But what is a B-52 going to do in Qatar? The you know, Iranians can wipe out the whole airbase in minutes. The missiles, the short-range and middle-range missiles that Iran can fire from the land and from the sea and from the air can destroy the whole country. What can? Why would a B-52 be stationed right in front of the Iranians. It's not a serious act. It's a token act. They know that they cannot attack Iran from Doha. But actually, as I said, it hurts them because it only it only diminishes Qatar in the eyes of the region, the public of the region. People across the region are saying, why is Qatar allowing the Americans to use their territory to threaten the resistance? So on the one hand, you have Al Jazeera, and then on the other hand, you have these American base. They're only reminding people the, the, what Doha means for the United States. So these are not real threats. It's not as if these B-52s mean anything. They can't do anything from Doha. And I think perhaps, and I don't know for certain, perhaps Americans are, they sent them to Qatar to tell their public that we're strong, but also to tell the Iranians that, look, we're not going to do anything. Because the Iranian military knows quite well that these planes are completely vulnerable, just as the air base is vulnerable. And I would add that the very presence of American bases in the Persian Gulf make the United States vulnerable, and in Iraq. 
this is not the 1980s or the 1990s where uh, those bases were way across the other side of the Persian Gulf. This is a new world that we're living in. Missiles and drones are the new weapons. Look at in Ukraine how, how dependent the Russians are on drones that they claim are Iranian. Whether that's true or not, it's not, a, you know, it's not for, for, for this discussion. But we live in a different world. A few bases on a few, you know, mini, in a few mini countries are not going to, and do not constitute a threat to Iran. Not only would those bases be swiftly destroyed, but so would those regimes. And the same is true in Iraq. The resistance in Iraq would immediately overrun American bases. So each of these is an Achilles heel. Each one of these bases. It's the Americans are literally hostage. And so are those regimes that host them. So uh, the Americans have not evolved, even though the world has evolved. They're paying, someone is paying a huge amount of money for each of these bases. In most cases, it's the American people. Someone was telling me earlier today that Trump, uh, you know, he, he wants to, he, he has an isolationist tendency, which is a good thing so that he can uh, rebuild America for the decades to come. And I was saying, well, true, but the United States has 800, 900 military bases across the world. Can Trump really voluntarily shut down those bases? Will they let him do that? Unless it's forced upon the United States by an economic collapse. I don't see that happening. So in any case, in any case, these bases are a heavy burden on the United States and those re uh, regimes in the region. And uh, they're more of a threat to the United States and these re regimes than they are to Iran. 